and communications. We've got joining online Sarah Serres, who's a medical doctor and MEP for the Socialist Party of Portugal. She's also a vice chair for a special committee on beating cancer. And the tennis Andrew Kaitis, who is a health advocate for the World Health Organization in Europe and the former EU Commissioner for Health and Food Safety. Uh, and in his spare time, the tennis is also a heart surgeon. So, without further ado, let's go over to some opening remarks, and we'll be starting with you, Wes. Uh, well, you had a great speech from Keir on health and social care this morning, so I'm tempted to leave it there and open it to questions. Um, but no, more seriously, it's great to be um, it's great to be here, and as a vice chair of the Fabian Society, it's really great to see you in person and online, uh, because the Fabian Society, once again, I think, as you showed throughout the pandemic, uh, able to think about how we continue to bring people together and actually broaden the debate. So I hope that hybrid events where people can participate right across the country will become the norm rather than the exception, because there are some things from the miserable experience we've had from the last couple of years of pandemic um, that have been positive and we should seek to, to keep those. Um, I, I was only partly joking when I said Kira had set out so much this morning. Um, uh, so I'm not going to, to repeat that because that wouldn't be very interesting. Instead, what I thought I would do is set out some of the political context for um, the arguments kids made um, to talk a bit about where the Tories will want to position health and social care and why we mustn't let them. And then to say a bit more about the future direction and where we need to be by the next general election. Um, the first point I wanted to make is that um, with all of the... Uh, controversy, all of the scandal, uh, the absolute mire of corruption and sleaze that the Tories find themselves in, it's just really important for the Labour Party to remember that it's not enough that the Tories lose the next general election, Labour needs to win the next general election. And Keir's speech in that context this morning was really important because it would be really easy to turn up to the Fabian Society, describe how awful Boris Johnson is, that he's a terrible liar, uh, to talk about how Labour will raise standards in public life and get a standing ovation and then leave. Um, why this morning's speech was so important is that it took um, a really big, um, really significant challenge for our country, and in contrast to the chaos and, uh, uh, that we've got in Number 10 and the absence of leadership, we have in Keir someone who is ready to be the Prime Minister with a plan for our country. And so throughout the course of this year, what you will see more and more from Keir and from the rest of us in the shadow cabinet is not just a critique of the government, but a Labour alternative that is there to inspire people that we can be trusted to govern, that we've got the ideas to change our country and give people the, the conviction and belief that they want us to win and will vote for us to, to win. The other thing I wanted to say by way of political context on health is that we know after our worst defeat since 1935, at the last general election, there was a lot to do to recover Labour's reputation and to earn back trust, not just in broad terms, but in particular areas, things like the economy, uh, national security, law and order. Um, health and social care is slightly different. Uh, Labour has been trusted uh, regularly, repeatedly on health ahead of the Tories, uh, pretty much throughout our time in opposition with one or two blips. Uh, but for us to have got through the 2019 election, that position, is in no small part thanks to the work that John Ashworth did as Labour's longest serving Shadow Health Secretary. Uh, and I can't praise or thank John highly enough for the work that he did, because in terms of our, our reputation with the public on health and social care, we're already in a very good, strong starting point. But we shouldn't be complacent about that. And we've got to show that we're not just resting on our laurels um, and being proud of Labour's past, but we've got a really ambitious view of the future. And that's particularly important in terms of the context that we find ourselves in today. Uh, we hope that London is past the peak of the Omicron variant, but across swathes of England, we're yet to see that peak. And while the government will tell you that London um, shows that the NHS can cope with the pressures of Omicron, uh, what I would say to you as a London MP is that London has barely coped in terms of the system pressures on the NHS. And what I can tell you as Shadow Health Secretary is that across the rest of England, the NHS system doesn't have the same capacity and resilience that London has by virtue of its population size and the range of services we have. So we shouldn't be complacent to um, or indifferent about 
the pressures that other services across England are currently facing. And when I look at some of the correspondence I've had in recent days alone about the impact of, of pandemic disruption to things like cancer care, which the government claims is protected, there are an awful lot of, lot of people out there who are very worried uh, about the disruption they're seeing to their care. And NHS staff and staff in social care are completely burned out. And one of the things we're going to have to think really seriously about is how we cover, re recover the service in order that we can recover the health of the, of the nation. The, we currently have waiting lists at 6 million, uh, unprecedented in our country's history, as Keir said this morning. And 24 hours in a and &E, I'm afraid, isn't just a TV programme. It's an experience that patients are having in accident emergency departments across our country. Uh, the government's responding by actually lowering performance standards. It's kind of the new approach to the Tories. Um, if they break the rules, they seek to change the rules rather than seek to meet the rules. And so the government is now establishing as, as, as standard expectations, waits of 12 hours in A&E, two years for referral to treatment, and even an hour just to get a transfer um, from the ambulance into hospital. Of course, that's if an ambulance turns up and you haven't been told to call a cab or phone a friend, as, at least, as has happened in at least one trust in the northeast of England. And the political challenge for Labour is that the Tories will say, of course NHS lists are at 6 million, of course we've had to lower performance standards. Haven't you noticed there's a pandemic on? This terrible pandemic has just made our lives so much more difficult. And that's why um, waiting lists are sky high and patients' experiences aren't so good. Well. That's true to an extent, but only to an extent. We went into the pandemic with NHS waiting lists of four and a half million, which was then a record. We went into the pandemic with NHS vacancies at 100,000. We went into the pandemic with social care vacancies at 112,000. So it's not just that they didn't fix the roof while the sun was shining, they dismantled the roof and removed the floorboards. And we've got to make sure the public know and understand that one of the reasons why patients' experiences are worse and one of the reasons why the NHS has struggled to cope, and one of the reasons why we've had harsher lockdown restrictions than might otherwise have been necessary, was because 12 years of Conservative government have left our NH has left our NHS and our social care system in a perilous state. And if they want to know why, they don't have to blame an invisible virus, they only have to look in the mirror. That's if Boris Johnson can remove himself from hiding in the Downing Street wine fridge. So looking to um, the future, well, you heard quite a lot from Keir this morning about what priorities will be in his contract for Britain, dealing with the immediate crisis and reducing waiting lists, putting mental health on a parity of esteem with physical health and promoting the broader well-being of the nation, focusing on prevention, not just treatment, which um, as, a, as, a, as a snappy short slogan doesn't do justice to the scale of change that will be needed, the scale of reform that will be needed if we are really serious about this. I think, I think prevention, technology, innovation, these have been um, sections of NHS five year four plans for years, and it's never been materialized. But we are, I mean, I can tell you, um, when Keir talks about prevention, he really, really means it. It's something that is, is very close to his heart, and I think is absolutely essential for the future of the service. Um, we'll be asking hard questions about value for money. Um, the NHS currently accounts for about 40% of all government spending. And bluntly, if it were to rise as a percentage of government spending, that would raise far greater questions about the sustainability of the NHS as a system. And believe you me, there are plenty of right-wingers in this country and elsewhere who do not believe in the National Health Service, do not believe in the principles that underpin the National Health Service, and want to make an argument that this system, which was might be fit for the, after the 1945 um, you know, emergence from the war, but it's certainly not fit for today. That's absolute nonsense, but the Labour Party has to be alive to that risk, and we have to make sure um, that we're spending that money as wisely as we can to get the best outcomes, and not to believe, as Keir said, you can just pour more money into the system, and that's the only answer. The system needs to change. And we need to give patients more power, um, and, and one of the interesting things about patients versus producer interests that doesn't quite work in the context of the NHS, I think, is that people go into health and social care because they care about patients. So it's not that staff work against the interests of patients or NHS managers work against the interests of patients, but sometimes I think everyone would acknowledge that the system can get in the way and sometimes there are competing interests. So we've got to work with the system through that to make sure that patients first. And of course, technology, as Keir said, 
um, it is already revolutionising healthcare, but we need to put our country at the forefront of those trends and not just lag behind. So the final thing I would say um, is about health inequalities and getting better outcomes. Um, if the government is really serious about levelling up, um, then healthcare needs to be a central part of it, and not just health treatment, but health in the broadest sense, which is not just about the Department of Health and Social Care, but is about health and well-being, sport, physical activity, education, good employment. This has got to be a cross-government priority. And what I would say to the country is that if you care about the NHS, if you care about health and well-being, and if you care about levelling up, never forget that these are labour ends that can never be achieved by conservative means. So if you want to see labour goals like a NHS fit for the future, like tackling injustice and inequality in our society, like levelling up, then you need to vote for the real thing and elect a Labour government. Thank you so much, Wes. What you've, what you've done there is outline the real scale of the challenge we have now post-pandemic, but also made it clear that a lot of those challenges were there before the pandemic, um, and also set out your stool as the new um, Shadow Health Secretary um, in terms of commitments for mental health, prevention, innovation, patient empowerment, and importantly, as you said at the end, health inequalities, health inequalities that aren't just restricted to the health and care system, but all of those social determinants of health, whereas it's education, climate change, so a really broad coverage. Thanks a lot, Wes. Um, I think we're next going to hear from Sarah on the screen. Hello. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Sarah, thanks so much for joining us. We're just having some opening remarks from speakers to kind of set out the stool um, on shared good health, particularly post-pandemic. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you, Andrea, and thank you very much for inviting me to this, um, to this event. I would like to guide you through what has been done at the EU level and how the Socialist and Democrats political group has been on the forefront to be asking that uh, what president from the Commission, the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, has been uh, saying last year in the State of the Union speech, a true European health union. And this is a point that has been uh, progressed by our political group. We know during the pandemic that um, the, the true importance that health has in our societies, and it goes far beyond just the provision of healthcare, which in the uh, European Union, is of the competence of each member state. However, the EU, together with member states, has a shared competence on protecting public health. Many lessons are to be learned from this global challenge that hits everyone in an unequal way, we must acknowledge, which is that nobody alone can address health emergencies or the threat of future pandemics alone. So this was the kicking point um, after the first lesson learned, let's say during the pandemic, as the beginning, you know, we have a lot of uncoordinated measures. What happened was at that moment before the pandemic, so we're talking about December 2019, there was um, being discussed in the European Parliament, a European health program with a budget of 500 million euros which is uh, a bit, le uh, a bit um, less, yes, in pounds. After the pandemic hit, a new proposal came, which uh, proposed a budget of 9.4 billion euros. We ended up negotiations with 5.1 billion euros for health. This means that the pandemic allowed us to negotiate and increase the budget for the health program for seven years for the whole of the European Union together with also external uh, third countries for more than tenfold. This is incredible and I would like to guide you of uh, what led us to this process because we need uh, a level of protection that actually protects everyone and leaves nobody behind. So I would like to say this uh, program for health is called the EU for Health program, has four main goals 
And together with what has been said by the first speaker, which is we must address health, but not only health, but also the social determinants of health. And this is a point that we, we, we won in the negotiations. It's a true uh, achievement from the progressive family, which is to have a health in our policies approach in this European health program and also one health approach. As you know, this is very important to have the, the side of health in each of the policy that is developed, but also one health approach without um, um, ignoring the interrelationship between human health, animal health and our environment. So this was a, a legislative package. Another one that we, we managed to work and it's currently being developed is the new package for European Union's response to health threats. It's being worked during 2021 and now we are in the final negotiations. We want to improve our agencies. We want to improve how we detect pandemics, how we detect other threats or other outbreaks. We want to improve accessibility to medicines and other medical products. We saw during the pandemic how dependent we were with third countries, especially um, India and China. And this is something we want to have a, a certain stockpiling of essential products. We want also to make these tools uh, available for everyone in the, in the European Union. I would like to also to tell you a bit what we are doing following uh, beyond the, the fight on the pandemic. We are developing the Europe's beating cancer plan. As you might all know, 30 to 50% of that, the deaths from cancer could be avoidable. So with this new program, we want to act in all the stages of the disease in the prevention and in the prevention part, a huge part with the research we need to know uh, because we, we still don't know which are the 50% of risk factors that cause cancer. We only know 50%. We only know alcohol causes cancer, tobacco, smoking, uh, physical inactivity, and so on, so on, so on, obesity, but we still don't know half of it. So we need to know the full story. So we want more uh, investments for research, for prevention, for disease, um, disease uh, um, uh, control, uh, diagnostics, early diagnosis, accessibility to treatment, and the fourth pillar that it's very important for our political family, which is quality of life for the carers and the patients as well. All of this in as again in a healthy no policies approach, which is a way to promote a all of government and all of society view, which will relate uh, integrate health subjects across all policy areas. We have many more um, legislation uh, legislation coming out there on regards to health, such as the European data space and also the pharmaceutical strategy. And we acknowledge something during the pandemic, and I hope we don't lose it, which is we are as stronger as our weakest link, meaning we can only advance if we advance together, reducing our inequities. And this is the most valuable lesson that we have, and especially one of the most important lessons that we, we need to, to, to learn from this pandemic and take, uh, take home, because we cannot abdicate from our common goal of delivering good health as an individual right for everyone. And that's why citizens count on us and we cannot by any means defraud their expectations and those of the future generations. I end here my, my opening remarks and I look forward for the Q&A. Thank Sarah, thank you so much. Um, just amazing to hear about all the work you've been involved with in the European Parliament, whether it's health inequalities, cancer, and particularly you mentioned there about pandemic preparedness, because it is an inevitability that pandemics will come around again. So uh, now is a really important time to think about how we can prepare for the next one, whether it's vaccine inequalities uh, and, and funding basic science research as well. So thank you so much. Um, and I think we're going to go to Serena next for your opening remarks. Oh, hi. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in the panel. And because I'm representing the Young Fabians, I think it will kind of be 
that have been lots of reference the last Fabian Society pamphlet, Prescription for Fairness, which focused a lot on health inequalities. I'm not sure how many of you in the room have got round to reading it, but there were some fantastic remarks in there and really shocking statistics that I didn't know. For instance, there was a chapter in it that said black those of black African origin were three point seven times more likely to die of COVID in the first wave than their white peers, and those of Bangladeshi origin were two times more likely to die of COVID. And I found that absolutely shocking. But then it also went on to say that those people from those um, people of those groups were also less likely to take up the vaccine due to years of institutional racism, particularly in the healthcare system. And that's one thing that I've also been exposed to through my work on the all party parliamentary group on menopause, kind of the idea of institutional racism in the healthcare system. We spoke to a really, really inspirational woman called Nina Cooperard, who runs a group called Black Women in Menopause. And she was talking about how kind of black women who go to the doctor with menopause symptoms are, don't feel like they're being listened to. They don't feel like they're being heard enough. And one point that was made in prescription for fairness that I thought could go a good way to kind of addressing some of these issues was the idea of getting those, getting a more diverse range of people into clinical trials, because then you kind of know why these inequalities are happening in the health system. Like right now, the calls for clinical trials are not going far enough. They're not being more inclusive. We do have these inequalities in the health system that so that can go one way to addressing. And I guess the second reason which Wes touched on as well was that the NHS was on its knees before the pandemic happened. This wasn't, the Conservatives will say a lot the pandemic has pushed the NHS to breaking point. The NHS was already there. The last Labour government did a fantastic job in cutting waiting time for the A&E to up to four hours. As you've mentioned, they've absolutely soared right now. And so many issues as well have fallen by the wayside. We've had generic checks that people have every year. I remember reading recently the story of a boy called Noah Herneman in Wales who missed his routine check for tumours, which he normally had every year because he had a condition where he was susceptible to them. Because of COVID, one of his sessions was cancelled. The next year, he was diagnosed with an inoperable brain tumour. We have to make sure that these routine checks go ahead. We have to make sure that screenings for conditions like that are available and also that they go further. Because as I said, I've worked with all part of parliamentary group of menopause. So many women who are menopausal get misdiagnosed with depression because there's no mandatory GP training for menopause, which is absolutely shocking when 50% of the population have to go through it and women are going to their doctor saying that they think they're depressed and the doctor isn't telling them that they think they're menopausal because they frankly don't know enough about the symptoms. We need to tackle this underlying lack of knowledge in the health system, fund better training and make sure that people are more aware of these issues. And another big issue that not enough people are aware about that I've worked on a lot in my work as a public affairs consultant is malnutrition where 30% of adults on admission to hospital and 35% on admission to care homes are found to be affected by it. And malnutrition costs the NHS 20 billion a year. It is a huge saving. But when was the last time you heard the Conservative government talk about malnutrition? I can't remember the last time the word left Boris Johnson's mouth, but not enough people are talking about it. And as I say, it's such a huge issue given the scope of people that are affected and the fact that Issues like malnutrition, if you get COVID, can lead to more serious impacts from COVID. It can lead to long COVID, can even lead to death from COVID, and it is entirely preventable. The National Institute for Clinical Excellence found that it is the third most effective cost saving to the NHS if tackled properly. So we do need to look into issues like this that people do not talk about enough and things that do affect the population at large and have fallen by the wayside. It could be a huge opportunity for, say, a Labour government to talk about things like malnutrition, even Labour and opposition to talk about things like that, because so much, so many of the population are affected by it, but no one talks about it enough, and it can be a great win given the Conservatives aren't talking enough about it. But the one thing that I did notice Boris did U-turn on, which a lot of people were talking about, was obesity. And of course, there is a link between obesity and deprivation, because upon leaving primary school, around 20 seven percent of children from low-income backgrounds were found to be obese which is three times more than their wealthier counterparts so obesity has been a big problem that's been sitting there for years particularly with children yet you've seen the conservative government cut short start they've cut healthy start they've cut all of this help for these kids that is really really needed but then when boris johnson himself is personally affected by having covid likely due to the fact that he was overweight he suddenly gets up and says yeah we're going to do a strategy to tackle obesity and again the strategy focuses on kind of negative nutrient kind of deterring people from having high fat salt and sugar foods kind of telling people no we're going to remove these from end of our we're going to remove these to check out you shouldn't have these foods but there was really a lack of focus on telling people what things that they should have for instance 
UK diets are really low in fiber, which the Global Burn of Disease study found caused low fiber intakes, caused 3 million deaths in 2017. When was the last time you heard conservatives talk about fiber? When was the last time you heard them talk about positive nutrients since like campaigns to have five a day years ago. It's all well and good telling people what they can't eat, but we also need to tell people what they should eat, and particularly those from low income backgrounds who might necessarily be a little bit harder to reach and cutting these schemes like Sure Start, cutting funding for schemes like Healthy Start, of course, is going to do detriment to these people. And finally, I'm just going to finish on saying that Obviously, we talk a lot about the climate emergency, particularly the Fabian side. I think he's really, really good at doing that. But there is, again, a link between climate and health that we don't talk about enough. Obviously, air, air pollution and air quality is becoming a massive issue that's emerging, particularly as we go towards net zero 2050. We are making some size to address that. But last year, we did have the first recorded death from air quality, from poor air quality, which I think is a huge milestone in terms of the fight that we need to take for climate change. I mean, the Fabian Society pamphlet already talked about how deaths from poor air quality are going to rise throughout this decade all the way to 2050. So net zero 2050 might not be enough, but we need to always incorporate health when we talk about climate because the two do go hand in hand. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Rachel. And, and the passion is palpable for so many of the things you said, whether it's climate change, um, your stories about malnutrition. Always happy to hear a plug for Prescription for Fairness, the Fabian Society's pamphlet on health inequalities. Um, and you mentioned the point about trial representations. So that was Professor Christina Pagel who, who wrote that essay, and, and she's, she's been a brilliant force. I'm sure many of you will have seen her on social media during the pandemic. Um, and, and you also brought up about just how many community groups there are out there doing brilliant stuff to do with health inequalities. A lot of them run by patients who suffer from the conditions they're advocating more treatment for. Um, and I think a lot of a lot of uh, the new health strategy uh, that you've described is about really kind of picking up those community groups and trying to replicate that best practice across the country. Um, we haven't been able to be joined by the tennis, but what that does mean is that we've got a lot of time, which I'm really happy about. Oh, are you here? Okay. Are you here? Can, can you I... can you hear me? Ah, oh, sorry. Colleagues, it's a roller coaster. Yeah, take it away, lieutenants. Yes, thanks for inviting to your conference, colleagues. Unfortunately, the UK has left the European Union, but stays in close relationship with the European continent and with the European Union. May I start with three observations that may be close to the hearts of people on British left. First, COVID-19 has upgraded the need for regional and global health cooperation. A notion of vital health goods and services as global public goods has potential to reshape or at least to polish up international politics. And SDG3 and universal health coverage still are our common obligations uh, around the globe and in, in within the European continent. Second, learning from the best European practices always was key for the in, in, in improvement of health status on the continent. Thus, mutually beneficial exchange of experiences between the UK and countries of continental Europe will benefit due to co creation of the European Health Union, or is it at risk? The third, growing role of health in national and international policies is beneficial for the socialist movement, social justice in health care and cure, access to primary health care and universal health coverage, leaving no one behind, are our common goals. Let me start with my first observation, global health cooperation. For the genesis of strong international cooperation for health, we may look to the constitution of WHO adopted in July 1946, a principle, the health of all people is fundamental to the attainment of peace and security and is dependent upon the fullest cooperation of individuals and states is enshrined in the constitution. And it is still our promise to deliver it to people. COVID-19 brought the understanding that no one is safe until everyone is safe, very close to people. Unprecedented level of 
public involvement and international cooperation rewarded the humanity with the record-breaking development and production of vaccines. And notions that COVID-19 vaccines are global public goods is capturing minds, and this is a progress. How many lives have not been saved because of profiteering the, of multinational corporations? The importance of a move towards vaccine justice on the global scale is already a fact, but the journey um, is far from over. Uh, it is a duty of nations and especially of left learning part of our societies to assure immunity to COVID-19 all over the world. Towards these ends, all opportunities provided by the traditional ways to assist the global south, as well as novel approaches, for example, patent waiver for production of vaccines, should be harnessed. The end of pandemic should not mean the hell halt of global public goods. I hope the experiences of international cooperation gained during the pandemic will initiate much broader development. It, it is up to us left um, uh, movement to do it. Second, European Health Union and the UK. Quite a long time, health policy was considered as a competence of nation, nation states, regardless of being or not in the EU. On the other hand, European history witnessed the fact that countries are wise enough to examine experiences of neighbors and learn from these experiences. Development of stronger European Health Union has potential to inspire new impetus in building the health and well being union. It has potential uh, uh, to increase cooperation of member states in fighting infections, in management of rare diseases, in health science, in health care and and of, uh, labor force management and so on and so on. Please look uh, uh, more, uh, 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 for more details on perspectives of uh, the European Health Union, uh, our manifesto published in November 2020. Stronger harmonization of health policies in the EU will make healthcare systems more transparent and easier to understand for all actors involved. It is in the interest of the EU and I assume for of the UK to consider partnerships while working on international projects. Most of avenues of pan-European cooperation would be more splendor with the EU and UK working shoulder to shoulder. The strong European Health Union can help European Union to develop strongest concept of global health and engage strength, strength, strength and cooperation with all uh, countries in European continent. Third, health is social, physical, and mental well-being, uh, and it is at the heart of socialist movement. Most of na national health policies are based on acknowledgement of, for market failures and elements of public goods in provision of prevention and cure of diseases. Lessons provided by COVID-19 is a proof that in the 21st century, national and international public actions in health made in strong cooperation have clear advantages in comparison to um, solutions provided only by market forces. Inequalities in healthcare and QM, social determinants in health, healthcare workforce shortages within countries and between countries, medical deserts, all those challenges require our common actions based on our social justice and solidarity philosophy. And no one country can solve it being alone. A part of health crisis, climate change, growing poverty, military conflict are the main challenges of the modernity that cannot be mitigated just by neoliberal politics. Uh, socialist theories have a strong footprint in modern environmental and social policies social, environment, and the health pillars based on solidarity and social justice should build the basis on the new European Health Union. Blending of socialist dimensions of traditional health, environmental, and social policies with acknowledgement of importance of public actions gained during the fight against COVID-19 provides a good opportunity to upgrade programs of socialist movement. According to my opinion, these upgrades would be instrumental to showcase relevance of socialist agenda to broader public. Strong European Health Union uh, require 
treaty changes, and uh, we are ready to move forward in these dimensions, discussing about uh, issues related to future of Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patelis, uh, for a real impassioned plea for cooperation, because we know that, of course, pandemics know no borders, and therefore, in order to tackle pandemics, you need strong cooperation across borders. And I picked up on that, that line you had, which I thought was brilliant, that no one is safe until everyone is safe in the context of vaccine justice. And we saw the situation in South Africa with Omicron, where, uh, as a country, they were ostracised, um, despite the fact that this variant could have cropped up anywhere. It just so happened to crop up there, where vaccination rates were significantly lower than some more developed countries. So uh, really, really good to hear that from you, and again, hear about some of the work that's, that's happening on the continent. Um, we've still got plenty of time for questions, which is brilliant. Um, so let's go straight into it, and we'll start with, yeah, a couple over there. So let's do two. Yeah, just, just the two. Oh, I can't really delineate three together. Let's do all three. Why not? Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I was very interested in the comment about parity of esteem for mental health. I myself have epilepsy, and for over 10 years, um, I suffered from a misdiagnosis and lack of appreciation from a National Centre of Excellence at Queen Square Hospital about an associated condition, which is interictal psychosis between seizures. Uh, I wonder if you can just up the game a little bit and develop the mental health parity of esteem to something that really recognises um, the development of um, a mental health approach that deals with it in the same way as physical health and recognises their um, complete um, uh, uh, shared uh, significance. Thanks very much. Thank you. And um, this morning, Keir talked about the pandemic plan um, and the work that WES is going to be um, leading and announcing in the next few days about um, making the NHS more resilient. I'd be really interested to hear more about that and also more about what we're going to do um, across the country and across the world to prepare for the next pandemic and what Labour and government will do. Because as Tom said, it's not sort of if, it's when there's another pandemic. And it would be interesting to hear more from Tom as well as someone who works in healthcare on that. Um, yeah, thank you very much for everyone's contribution. I'm particularly was uh, um, in, encouraged by hearing Serena um, point out the racial inequalities that affect health. Um, it's something that has long been it's long been on people's radars, except there's been a sort of almost suppression of that that information and. Uh, COVID has actually really exacerbated that. So my call to to Labour is. Um, to have embedded in our in our health policy much more ethnicity data collection because across the board and serena quite eloquently uh, gave different examples whether it's uh black maternal health uh whether it's mental health uh the, you know the outcomes that uh ethnic uh minorities face are actually even given the same socioeconomic uh conditions as their white counterparts are so much worse Worse. So could that be embedded in, 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 our, in our policy going forward? Thank you. Um, three, three brilliant questions. Um, one on mental health parity of esteem, another on pandemic preparedness, um, and the third one we've just heard there on uh, ethnicity and health inequalities with a particular focus on data collection. So as if it's all right, we'll kick off with you and then perhaps Serena will go to you afterwards. Yeah, sure. Um, uh, on mental health parity of esteem, I mean, I think it's, it's really significant to to point out that following the last shadow cabinet reshuffle, Keir took a decision, um, correctly in my view, um, that the uh, shadow cabinet should reflect the cabinet um, and we should directly mirror, and I say that as someone who had a job previously which did not directly mirror the government, there are lots of good reasons why that should be the case. Um, but mental health was an exception and Rosanna Alan Khan, as well as being part of my team, uh, attends shadow cabinet as the shadow minister for mental health and I think that is a very strong signal uh, and commitment to the priority that Keir attaches to mental health. I think it's really significant that a big part of Keir's speech, not just today but thinking back to conference, uh, was on mental health and not just in um, sort of broad principle terms 
but really significant commitment. I mean, that commitment that people should receive mental health treatment within a month requires a big change and will make a huge difference. I can tell you just from my casework, let alone the, the sort of the work that I do now. Um, you're right to challenge the issue pre-treatment, which is about diagnosis and recognition and making sure that um, not just in terms of the prevention principle that Keir talked about, where, you know, if we're thinking about mental health and well-being in, in a broader sense, um, there's lots of things we can do well outside the health and social care system to promote good mental health and well-being. Um, but there are a number of conditions that um, aren't, aren't diagnosed quickly enough um, add to people's challenges. And so we've got to we've got to improve things there. But I hope that um, the, the, the priority that Keir attaches to it is reassuring and helps persuade people at the next election that when we talk about parity of esteem between mental and physical health, which is not a new notion or a new slogan, uh, we really mean it and we'll, we'll have policies to deliver it. Um, uh, Mariana, your question, I, I'm, I'm glad you made the final point, which is um, when you look at um, racial disparities in healthcare, um, many are linked to class, and those are issues, again, thinking about prevention outside of um, health and social care. Um, it is not surprising to me, particularly thinking about the community, not so much that I represent, but the one on the other side of the A12 in Ilford South, not surprising to me um, that lots of black and Asian people were disproportionately threatened with COVID-19 and exposed to the virus. When you look at the overlap in terms of overcrowding, temporary accommodation, um, the sorts of conditions that people are living in. Um, but that doesn't explain all of it. And, um, and it comes back to the fundamental point about the importance of having diverse representation in Parliament. Um, when you look at the work that lots of black MPs, particularly black women, have been making in terms of um, black maternal um, health, um, the really powerful speech that um, Belle Riviera Addy, the MP for Streatham, made about her own experience um, representation really matters um, and I want to make sure that when we're thinking about um, health policy and the priorities of the next Labour government we're thinking very carefully about the health needs of all of our population and that that again is going to be a big cultural change if you think about um, women's health for example um, not even black or Asian women's health but women's health more generally women make up the majority of the population and yet if you look at things we were just having a conversation earlier about um, fertility um, conditions that so many women experience in terms of um, polycystic ovary syndrome and the, the challenge that women face in terms of getting access to the right drugs that women who pay to go private will get the right prescription women who are in the NHS do not um, when you look at um, everyday experiences that women have around the menopause um, that's going to require a big change and I'm really pleased that Ferial Clark in our shadow health team will be leading that work on women's health um, but, but rest assured, it's a priority for, for me too. Um, and the final thing I just wanted to say was around living well with COVID, um, which I'll be saying more about tomorrow. So I'm not going to spike that today. Um, but um, I, I just think what, what I, the point I really want to get across to, to the country is that um, the Tories talk about living with COVID and there are two approaches within the Conservative Party. There's the um, swivel-eyed backbench kind of Desmond Swain ilk um, for whom living well with COVID means removing all mitigations and protections against the virus and just letting it run rip. And worse still, sometimes either parroting anti-vax nonsense or turning into the Tory Tea Party tendency and attacking government scientists in the way that we've seen. And then there's the Sajid Javid, Boris Johnson approach, where they say we need to live well with, you know, we need to live with COVID, but it's a, it's a, it's a slogan without a plan. Um, what we'll be setting out is a genuine plan to live well with COVID um, that reassures people that it is possible to return to a degree of normality if you've got the right um, things and the right measures in place. Um, and um, some of it will not come as a great surprise, things like testing and vaccination. Uh, which remain really important tools. Um, but the one thing I don't mind saying today, is we've, we've said it before, and it's really important, and comes back to the point that's been made by um, our friends on the screen. Um, the biggest step we could take now to prevent the risk of new variants and dangerous new variants 
is to vaccinate the world. And it is frankly scandalous that there are so many countries still in the world where the vaccination rate is below 10%. And this is not just about doing the right thing, important though that is. Um, and Gordon Brown in particular has been doing an amazing job making the moral case in the way that Gordon Brown does, does so powerfully. This is also an act of national self-interest in vaccinating the world and protecting others, we are protecting ourselves. And that's got to be an important part of this. And I'm, I'm, one of the reasons I'm glad that the Fabian Society is partnering up with FEPS is that when you think more broadly beyond COVID, to big health challenges, whether it's on um, research, science, innovation, treatment, um, you know, global health challenges require global solutions. And it's really important in particular that we don't lose the strong European science base and ecosystem that the UK was part of as part of the European Union, and that we promote dialogue and collaboration on science, research and healthcare for many years to come. Great, thanks, Wes. And yeah, I just kind of wanted to pick up on something you said about living with COVID and all vaccinating the world. I'm so glad you said that and that it's a priority because we don't talk about that enough. I remember when the Omicron variant first came to be, I think there was some evidence that it was discovered elsewhere in Africa before even going to South Africa. And obviously people just initially when it came out thought, oh, it's, it's a South African thing, like just avoid South Africa, avoid the people coming in. But to quote my international relations degree here, we live in a globalised world with international travel being so major, new variants are going to keep coming. And as you say, we need to vaccinate the world to kind of get through that. And then another point on living with COVID, of course, is the impact of long COVID. And I've seen my uncle become personally affected by long COVID. He got COVID back in March 2020, so right at the start of the pandemic. And he is almost kind of a shell of what he once was in that he is, feels very, very weak when he does any kind of exercise. I remember he basically self-isolated for the first six months, didn't really see any of us, didn't really see anyone. And even now, he's still very run down and doesn't feel like himself and constantly has to go for checks. And long COVID does have a huge impact on people. I mean, if we're going to live with COVID, we need to account for the fact that around one in 20 people will get long COVID. And it is, it is going to be a very serious pressure on the NHS. And of course, one way that we can deal with that is through the investing in things like medical nutrition and ensuring that particularly those who come out of the ICU are still given medical nutrition upon discharge from hospital. I mean, there was a study by Nutrition, like a big nutrition company, which found that just 42% of those in the ICU were given medical nutrition when leaving hospital. And we've got to make sure that it becomes a priority that we keep giving it to people to make sure that they are effectively treated from long COVID. And again, on the point of racial inequalities in the health system, of course, that's something that needs to be tackled massively, as I spoke about earlier. And one big way to do this is through partnering with organisations that are focusing on things like that, kind of taking the focus away from the centre, as Wes said, getting more diverse representation in Parliament, but also ensuring that the voices of those behind these organisations that are working so hard to make people aware of this are in Parliament and they are they are liaising with MPs that people in power are reaching out to these people and saying we want to hear from you we want to, you to share your stories we want to take these on we want to publicize them and I think the value of partnership in health is absolutely essential and then again the last thing I want to say on this is um, one big example of partnership in health is of course partnership with the private sector and I know that the Labour Party as a whole is very much like we need to invest in the NHS we need to kind of do as much as we can as a government and it's not talking about any kind of privatization of healthcare but even things like public private partnerships can work incredibly effective in the UK whole grain consumption is a quarter of that in Denmark but in Denmark whole grain consumption doubled when there was a public private partnership on fiber where the government, industry and health organisations all work together to boost fibre intakes. And they did boost fibre intakes by 50% in 12 years, which is absolutely incredible thinking about it. So that could be another avenue we go down, not just reaching out to these organisations and making their voice heard, but creating these partnerships to make sure that everyone has a voice in government and nobody's left behind in healthcare. Um, Sarah and Vitenis, I don't know if there are any of those questions uh, that you wanted to pick up on in particular, but there was certainly something around pandemic preparedness, which Sarah, I know you spoke a lot about in your work in the European Parliament. Were there any, any key, key tips, key principles for, for, for the UK when it comes to that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, th thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. I would like to just uh, include there a part on, on pandemic prevent uh, preparedness and prevention. Uh, which is something that we have been um, actually finishing the, the negotiations on the legislation here at, at the EU level, which is that uh, in order to be 
better prepared to, to, for pandemics, we must have a, a, a greater collaboration with third countries. Unfortunately, this is the case now with the UK. And this is something that we need to pick up and uh, assure that nobody and even regions are left behind. And I would just like to add on, uh, on a point that was raised on, on vaccine equ equity, which is uh, something that it's, it's, it's quite an uh, astonishing, uh, astonishingly, sorry, um, that we haven't had, we, we have a vaccine, we have a tool that allow us to, 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 to contain the pandemic, to, to be better prepared to face it. It's not a treatment, but it's, it's something that uh, guarantees that you don't go to the ICU and get a ventilator, which by itself is quite good. It gives you a greater um, life expectancy in that sense, in case you get uh, COVID. And what I would like to say here is, is that it is morally unacceptable that vaccines are not reaching the whole globe. And we have called, our political group in the Parliament, European Parliament have called for the way, uh, temporary waiver of patents in order for vaccines to reach all, all sides of the globe. And it's not only through waiving patents, of course, we need to ensure that all, um, all stages of the production and distribution capacity are in force. We are at a war against the virus and we must deploy every tool we have at our, uh, at, at our side in order to overcome and win this war. Otherwise, it's going to mutate and we don't know what the next strain will have us in its, uh, in its, uh, in its way. So, so we're still very much vulnerable. Brilliant, thank you, Sarah. Yes, I fully agree with what just Sarah said, but may I draw your attention, uh, our attention of all left forces in the European uh, continent. Of course, uh, we all know very well that today's situation with international health regulation and obligations to implement international health regulations requirements on the ground are far from reality. And international health regulation is very weak one. We need to think about possibilities to move in the direction to have pan global pandemic treaty. And for us, for left forces, for progressive, for progressive, we need to do more encouraging our parliaments, about socialist groups, our parties, to do more uh, building global health much stronger and pro pro uh, pro providing uh, all you know, necessary tools to build new global pandemic treaty. We need to have pan-European, uh, like to say, global um, uh, pan-European health risk council, and we need to globally have much more coordinated governance of all, all you know, threats and crises. No doubts, without more effective international uh, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, valid instruments. We have no chance to move forward. And from my point of view, uh, global pandemic treaty is a very important now issue discussing all issues at European Parliament level, at the European Council level, uh, and of course also globally. Brilliant. Thank you, the tennis. Um, I think we've got time for another a very quick round of questions. So I'm going to do one from the online uh, lot and then two more in the room. Um, so whilst I read the online one out, we'll have this lady over here okay, uh, and this gentleman over here. So the question online, um, this is from Shabina. Locally, in my Tory controlled authority, we've been told that people have to step up and look after their loved ones. How can we fund social care in an increasingly aging population under local authorities safely and effectively? Thank you. So the pandemic accelerated the use of uh, technology throughout the NHS. So we had rollout of MS Teams across the NHS, we've got virtual wards, and we've got online outpatient appointments. But we know that some of the poorest in society are digitally excluded. So how can a future Labour government make sure that we make the most of digital technology whilst not losing the value of face-to-face -face healthcare interactions, particularly in, through the use of things like community pharmacy? Um, 
Thanks, uh, thanks very much, Tom, and thank you to everyone on the panel. Um, it was the founder of the NHS, My Bevan, who said the language of priorities is relation to socialism. And on priorities, there are so many things that we can do to fix the NHS from the mess that Tories have left in it. But that doesn't just take one term flash in the pan Labour government, it takes two term Labour government, it takes a three term government, a four term government, which is why winning elections is so, so important. So, to first of all gain that credibility, what is the, what is the one priority that we can at least start on? first and foremost in the Labour government going forward from all the fantastic ideas that we've heard uh, for the NHS. What is the top thing that we can do, the most effective thing that we can do straight away? Brilliant. Three great questions and three short minutes. <laughs> Wes, <laughs> you're the worst person to go do short answers. <laughs> um, but I'll be brief. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Shab Shabina, I'm so tempted just to duck your question on, on funding of social care. Um, because this is this is a, a really big challenge um, and one that we need to look at in a number of ways, not least, um, you know, tax and spending policies, you know, in the round. And I know there's sometimes some frustration when, particularly for, for journalists, when we appear on um, TV or, or in print and, they, and people say, well, you know, will you increase this tax rate or cut that tax rate? But we've seen with the Tories where that gets us, where you end up with decisions taken in, in silo and then when you look at those decisions in the round, you realise who's being clobbered. It's, and in the case of the Tories, it's working people. Um, so I, I say this question with the Chadwick Chancellor sat at the back of the room, and I want to restate for the record how important I said it was to get value for money from the existing NHS budgets, Rachel, not just to pour more money in. You're the only person applauding. Um, and uh, you're also, frankly, <laughs> in this conversation, you're the only one that matters. <laughs> So anyway, um, uh, uh, I'll be careful what I say. Um, I, I, do, <laughs> I do think, though, that what you are seeing regularly from the Labour Party at the moment are the differences in terms of priorities and where we would um, you know, tax fairly and where we would spend wisely. And you saw that with the, with the cost of living intervention around energy bills and prices. Um, you, you're seeing that with the way we're going after the Tories for their working class dementia tax and the way in which they're using national insurance as a, a, a blunt instrument, which is being used to justify it in terms of social care, but actually um, it isn't even going to reach social care. Um, so I think the, the approach I'm taking, I'm looking at social care with Karen Smith and Liz Kendall um, as its kind of priority for me. Um, we've got to work out the kind of care we want to provide first and foremost, and then how we fund it. And you heard Keir set out the five principles this morning, uh, but I don't think it's enough to say to people, um, we want to keep the system the same and this is how we'll fund it. We need a better social care system and then we need to set out how we fund it. Um, Claire, you're absolutely right on use of technology and um, huge potential here to revolutionise and transform the way that we do healthcare um, in this country. Uh, but we can't leave people behind. And I think that's a broader government agenda around tackling digital exclusion. But this is why I will say to the system again and again, um, I don't use the language of when people need to see a GP, they should be able to. I use the language of when people want to see a GP, they should be able to. I will always be on the side of patient choice and what makes patients comfortable. But you're also right um, to point out you know, to point to community pharmacy and, and other areas because the, the front door to the NHS, which is the GP, um, is overwhelmed and we need to create more front doors into conversations about health and care. And if I can, can be slightly challenging to, to GPs, um, I think that the pandemic has shown that the sort of the natural GP anxiety that if you create other front doors into the NHS, it screws their financial model and then their provider interest kicks in, say no reform. Um, I think the pandemic has shown that we can't go on with the status quo. And I think we can take GPs with us on this agenda in the way that maybe we haven't been able to before, he says optimistically. Um, and finally, um, on priorities, um, the thing that we will continue to bang on about over and over again um, is waiting lists and waiting times, because time is of the essence, particularly on things like cancer, which I know only too well from personal experience. Um, it's something that we know is at the top of the public mindset, and it's something where we know the last Labour government really delivered. So when you're when you're challenging the Tories on their incompetence, and people say, well, how, how do we know a Labour government be any better? We can point them back to the last one, where we left office with the lowest waiting list in history, and the Tories have now bequeathed us the highest waiting list in history. That's the difference a Labour government makes, and that's why people should put their trust and confidence in Labour. Thank you.
we are out of time, um, so that just leaves me to say thank you so much to our brilliant panellists, um, but most importantly to the audience um, and the brilliant questions you brought. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the conference.